thank you all for agreeing to be part of this discussion and to um, help us listen to your experiences and hopefully develop a better understanding and uh, as far as what the situation really is um, and what we need to be aware of as humans in this world. Um, we, both Jeff and I are really, I mean, humanity is the important thing to us and we view everything that we do, we try to view everything we do in a very holistic sense. Um, we realize, you know, actions have impacts far down the line and so, you know, everything that we try to open up as far as this conversation and actions we take, we want to be very cognizant of all those impacts. So. Our goal was really to, as <clears throat> white people, is to really listen. And sometimes finding those opportunities to listen to stories is difficult. So we're trying to, we're trying this one thing to try to open up the conversation so that we can listen. Um, we started this back, well, we started this back in April when COVID hit as focusing on what was needed right now, which we felt were adaptability, resilience, and then being comfortable in the new normal. So we hit adaptability in April, and then May we were gonna do resilience, and it was at the end of the month, so it was right after the George Floyd murder. And so the conversation shifted, and we were focusing more on the resilience needed for people who are facing prejudice or discriminatory actions or behaviors or policies and on a daily basis on a daily basis yeah. yes yeah. and what is needed in that uh, focus or perspective of resilience and we ran that on twitter and we did get some conversation back but everyone that we got conversation back from were also white so this identified to us that as a company, we need to do better, uh, have a better outreach so that people feel free to engage with us on social media or in person. But also it, it pointed out that since our audience is white, we need to also bring to them these stories so that they can listen if they don't have those opportunities to listen elsewhere in their world and then figure out how to open up those conversations if they do have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we reached out to all of you because you all have very different perspectives and experiences here in Ireland. And <clears throat> we also want to bring about some of those practical steps or even conversation openers that people can use so that they can try to open up the conversation in their own world so that they can try to listen to the stories without the defensiveness that perhaps like my family definitely has whenever we talk about these situations, um, specifically the most recent uh, um, protesting uh, situations in the States and how that is misconstrued and what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're coming from it from a lot of different uh, avenues but mostly we want to listen to what you have to say and throughout this conversation we open it up to you for discussions we may ask you questions or probe a little deeper to make sure that we have a full uh, understanding but really this is not the time for us to talk this is the time for us to listen so thank you again for agreeing to be a part of this and for sharing your stories um, we know well, between the two of us, we know each of you pretty well. And so again, we welcome your honesty and your openness. And we want to also say that, you know, we are safe here. Um, we are recording this and we can edit it. So if there's anything that you are uncomfortable with, just let us know. But on top of that, I think I would also say if it gets uncomfortable, that's okay. This is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. And like, we, we know like, this 90 minute conversation or however long we have today is not going to solve it but it's all about having it serve as a starting point for for maybe other people who who don't know how to initiate this kind of discussion um to start having these discussions that we all need to be having so yeah yeah um i, I think before we jump in uh it'd be really great maybe if we could get a quick intro from each of you 
Um, Selena, would you, would you mind kicking off first? So where do I begin? My background is mostly legal. Um, I'm not a practicing solicitor here in Ireland. I don't have my, call, my practicing cert, but I do work in-house counsel or privacy counsel for a local newspaper. I won't go on and name exactly who it is, but my no background, my background would be, I've got a, a legal background, but it's varied. I have a background in international relations and pol political science. I've done my law degree here in Ireland, so I have an honours degree in, in law for Irish law. And I've also done recently a master's in law with a speciality or a, a focus on humanitarian law and corporate law. So my master's thesis was on sexual exploitation, abuse violations of UN peacekeepers and the gender, um, gender disparity from feminist perspective. So that's to kind of give you a bit of background of where my expertise will gleam the cube in this regard. Well, and I think you've, uh, you've an interesting just experience, of, you know, given your, your background, where you've lived, uh, where you've ended up today as well. I mean, like us, you're originally from the United States, yep. uh, but you, you've got a circuitous journey here to Ireland. Well, that's it. Yeah. Originally I'm from Miami. Um, you know, didn't come here from Miami. I came here from San Diego, but before San Diego, I lived in Ohio. So like Jeff and Mindy, I was the neighbor to them, to, you know, the cornfield, middle American, you know, environment. Me and that environment would have had a few interesting experiences, you know, coming from Miami to there. So, yeah, definitely my parents, very varied background. My mom and dad are West Indian. Well, my mother is Portuguese, or they say Portuguese, and my dad is Indian. So, I'm kind of a mix because not only is my mother Portuguese, she's also indigenous South American Indian as well. So I'm both Indians, Native American and Indian and Portuguese. So I've definitely, I have been called everything in the book and I've been approached by people trying to figure out whether I fit the black or the white category. And, you know, for me growing up in a masala that I did, you know, to me, there isn't a black and a white. There's so much yeah. in between that I think Absolutely. a lot of people forget. Um, they forget that there's a lot of spice in the world and they're looking at it from a salt and pepper standpoint. That's beautiful. Thanks, Selena. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself to everybody as well? Uh, so my, my full name is Tarien Guatering, as you can see there. Uh, my, my, the, the cage phrase for picking up girls when I was young was uh, uh, so good, they named me twice, you know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, my first name and second name are exactly the same uh, for listening from where I come from. I'm from, Ori I'm from Zimbabwe originally, and I've been in Ireland for 16 years now. Everyone calls me TT because they just found my name tongue twisting. So everyone just called me Double T. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'm, I'm an associate partner in, in one of the accounting firms based here in, in, in Dublin. Uh, married with three kids. Uh, I'm, I'm married to Rumbi, who's also from uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, so, uh, like my interest in, in conversations like the one we are having uh, is basically, but well, I'm obviously black uh, and uh, being a minority here, and, and actually having, uh, interestingly observed how, how Ireland has changed from you know, when I came in 2004 uh, in relations to race. So I really look forward to having this uh, stimulating conversation and see how we can basically change the narrative as we evolve our Irish culture. Yes, we're, we're so happy to have you here today, TT. Thanks, man. Um, Hugh, let's, let's move to you, talking about somebody who's seen how Ireland's changed over the, a number of years. Born and bred here. Because I'm old. Thank <laughs> you. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what brings you here today. Yeah, so thanks for the invite. Uh, and I think Mindy set it up really nicely. As a white person here, I'm definitely here to listen more than to speak. But I suppose from my background, as you touched on, I've uh, worked in HR for about 20, 25 years. So a kind of professional awareness of uh, diversity and inclusivity. Uh, as kind of TT referred to, I've seen Ireland uh, mature and grow and develop. So kind of growing up in Ireland in the 70s and 80s, it was definitely homogenous. It was recession riddled. Uh, the trend was emigration, not immigration. And anybody of color or anybody who was ethnically diverse was a unique 
I mean, the, the joke or the, the commentary that was when I was a kid was if you met somebody who was black, they were either a diplomat or a medical student because there was no other reason for those people to be in Ireland. And so it's lovely to see that kind of develop and evolve. And I suppose my background is I did a primary degree in sociology originally. And more recently, I've kind of gone back to those models to try and work out and kind of take a view as to what's happening as a, as a culture. Uh, and it's nice to see that uh, Ireland has developed in that we're encouraging more Americans to come here and stay. Uh, I suppose the other thing then, from a personal perspective, in about 2005, both myself and my wife, uh, Maria, set out on a journey and we got lucky uh, in the line of intercountry adoption. So we're the parents of two pretty wonderful boys. Uh, Taraku is uh, about 10 years old now, but he was born originally in Ethiopia. And then uh, in 2016, we got the opportunity to adopt another little boy, uh, Joshua, who was born in Kentucky. Uh, unfortunately, that's that little. Well, no, he's a hitter. He is, yeah. So for those of you who remember American football in kind of the 1990s or noughties, there was a guy called William Perry, who used to be referred to as the refrigerator, uh, because he was about six foot six and about... 250 pounds. Josh is that kid. <laughs> I'm hoping he does become that kid because then I intend to re retire and to, you know manage him on a professional basis. <laughs> but he was born in Kentucky, uh, which unfortunately is a red state, uh, something that I will warn him about in the future. And I suppose kind of on reflection, we were quite keen uh, being kind of an ethnic diverse family to make sure that Tarku wasn't the only black kid in a white world. So we actually went back, I suppose, deliberately to, or purposefully to adopt somebody of color. Uh, we didn't think it was going to be America, but that's where it turned out. So really that's my kind of experience or myself and Maria's experience. My interest here is I'm particularly conscious of the way that the Irish culture has evolved and changed. I'm kind of a parent of a kid or two kids who've got an ethnically different background, they're very early on in that kind of journey as black people in a white world, which is really how I see Ireland. And I'm kind of interested to see how do we shepherd them into that world? How do we guide them? How do we equip them for that? And equally then, how do we add to the change in the political geography? Because certainly it's a much more ethnically diverse environment for them as they grow up than for me. But they're going to be essentially black kids in the white world. So how do we actually manage that and kind of navigate that uh, view? So that's really kind of my background. Thanks for sharing here. Uh, Deborah, would you mind just uh, who you are, kind of what brings you here today? Yeah, so I am a consultant in PwC. Um, I uh, trained as an accountant there, so I am a chartered accountant, but please don't hold that against me. Um, and um, I also run a, also a social entrepreneur. Um, I run a charity called Empower the Family. Um, we are building Ireland's first social student housing development. And I'm the only woman in Ireland who who leads a company who, who was nominated on the Forbes 30 on the list this year, which I'm very, very proud of. Um, but yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Oh, and I have an 11-year-old and a hamster. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. We're really happy to have you here. Waheed, would you mind introducing yourself to everybody as well? I'm a software engineer at a, a Dublin tech company. Um, I know Jeff through that. Uh, kind of, um, and he reached out to me to get involved in having this chat, which uh, I appreciate. Um, yeah, I have a 12 year old daughter, um, and a part time dog uh, who was with me sometimes. Excellent, <laughs> yeah, I want to thank you all for joining and really look forward to the different perspectives that each of you bring here. I, now, in speaking to each of you about why we wanted to have the conversation today, I you know, um, we obviously, we, Mindy mentioned what happened with, with the murder of George Floyd in late May and kind of the pivot we did on what we were talking about ourselves and, and this issue of, or this notion of like the resilience that you have to have to be, as, as Hughes kind of said, a, a black person in a white person's world um, and what that takes and how people often don't really see that. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that kind of inspired us to actually have this conversation that was about the existence of racism in Ireland. It's something that sometimes we like to think 
it's not really here, you know, that maybe this is all that stuff that we see going on over there on the other side of the ocean is an American problem. And as Americans, I guess, who have choose, chosen Ireland as home, you know, we, we obviously can see a lot of the ways in which that American culture gets imported into Ireland. But, but one of the things that we don't want to see imported is, is that kind of mentality, that sort of um, exclusionary kind of politics um, that, are, that are perhaps a bit more overt than they might be here in Ireland. But like we, we came at this, I think, from a position of that, you know, even though there's, this is a, a very different context that we have here in Ireland, we don't have the history of slavery, say, that you would have in the United States. And we might like to look at ourselves as a much more progressive society these days, given the referendums we've had recently on um, same-sex marriage, abortion, changes to legislation around divorce. Um, but the reality, I guess, as we see it, is that <clears throat> racism does exist here in Ireland. It's, it's there. It might be more covert. It might be uh, more subtle. Um, but, the, the, you know, if you think obviously if anything's going to change for the better, like there's got to be an acknowledgement and an understanding first of the reality of the situation. And I guess that kind of maybe transitions us into like wanting to hear from each of you. Like what's, what's your own experience been living in Ireland as someone who maybe doesn't fit the typical mold. Um, because even though I'm an immigrant myself, uh, just like TT and Selena, I can pass for an Irish person a lot of times until I open my mouth and they hear my accent. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Hugh might differ, <laughs> beg to differ on that. But, uh, but it's, you know, it's a radically different experience I would imagine for both of you than it is for me. Definitely, I agree, like, I mean, for instance, for me, uh, I came here back in 2004, 2005, and I remember I was working in a small law firm, and one of the girls, really sweet country girl, you know, comes up to me, walks up behind me, and runs her hand through my hair, and she says, oh, wow, I'm surprised your hair is not Afro at all. And I just looked at her, and, you know, I was, I was young, you know, it was just, coming into my 20s and I was just appalled you know coming from you know coming from America back then America was very different than the absolute joke that it's turned into uh, um, recently but I was like what do you mean my hair is not afro and it wasn't it wasn't annoyance or upset that she thought I was black like look if I was more power to it it was the annoyance that she didn't bother or nobody along the line bothered to educate her or diversify her or expose her to cultural difference and relativity. She automatically thought that I fit into a box of either black or white. And it goes back to what I said. It's this concept of a salt and pepper world. And there's so much more spice in between. And that was, I was just, I was so taken back. You know, I was 20, what, I was 22, 21 at the time. And I, you know, I was just like, how is this girl who's maybe two years younger than me, doesn't know the difference can't look at me and say well she's either she's either hispanic or she's indian or she's not black it's just like how you know i look at somebody else even if i look at a white person down the road i can tell sometimes even without them opening their mouth i'm like okay well they're probably nordic norwegian or dutch or you know but i'm not going to automatically and say oh hey hey you you brit <laughs> <laughs> it's just that annoyance but at the same time I was annoyed and angry for a split second, but at the same time, I was empathetic because I knew there was a diversity issue. It was an ignorance issue, not a negative ignorance, but a positive. The fact that, you know, it'd be like somebody seeing the color red for their first time living in Technicolor. Mm. Mm. And I've had other things. When I came around, I had somebody stop me on the road. I had this little old Irish woman stop me and she's like, oh my God, you're so exotic. You're so different what are you? And I'm like, well, I'm a 20 something year old American woman walking down the street, Camden street in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. It's funny even listening to you because some of those experiences are similar to, to what I experienced in 2004. Uh, and, and I think the difference is at least they asked for permission. So they asked to touch my hair because it, it looked a bit kinky and and different and and, and I, I I let them touch touch the hair. They were actually my colleagues that I went with at the time, uh, and like similarly, it it really didn't bother me at the time because 
for most of them, they'd actually not encountered a black person. That was the first time. So it was curiosity that actually, well, if you then realize they are, it's discriminatory. Uh, although, although it's not intended, they, they're just going to be reminding me, look, we are different. You're not like any any of us here. But so, so, so just agreeing with you, I think uh, racism actually exists in Ireland. But although it's not, it's not really a dominant narrative, uh, because I, I wouldn't say the majority of people are out there going and hating people who are different to them, but they are, there's a, a large percentage of people who subconsciously they are not even aware of these microaggressions where they're saying stuff or they're behaving in a certain way that automatically discriminates people even without 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 intent mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's actually more more common than, than people realize and, and as we when you're discussing anyway hopefully we can we can place a few uh, pointers or some of the things they could actually do like uh, i remember i was actually flying somewhere and you heard that there was a similar story on, on in the press a few a few weeks back, uh, someone assumed uh, because I was standing in the business uh, 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 travel, uh, business class queue that I was in the wrong queue. She just assumed uh, because I was traveling for business. Of course, I wasn't paying <laughs> paying for it myself. Uh, it was on business uh, and a long haul trip. But she assumed the uh, the lady fly from the, the the airline asked me to move queues. But I took the opportunity to educate with love and, and really explain, say, look, I, I, I appreciate it might not appear like uh, I should be in this queue. I'm actually traveling on one business and, and, and this is all funded by the activities that I do. Uh, so by you assuming that I'm in the wrong queue, it might imply that you, you, you are, you're you saying that black people shouldn't be here. She apologized. She was surprised and shocked that what she had just done implied Mm. That that's a, it exposed their subconscious uh, uh, thinking, but that was never the intent. TT, that reminds me a little bit of the story you were telling me when we were talking the other day about, you know, being in kind of an executive setting for an event, and someone mistook you as a member of the wait staff as opposed to like someone who was actually supposed to be there. It's and it's. And what you said about how she didn't even realize that situation, and to me, that just kind of speaks to that, like pro that programming that many of us aren't aware of that just exists out there that supplants these ideas in your head, even though you might not be consciously aware of it. No, no, you're right. Like, like I, I think uh, I, I like the salt and pepper uh, 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 analysis. I'll use it for the rest of my life. Th thank you. I'll steal that one. Uh, but, but you see, our, our sociocultural construct actually informs how we, we, we view life. And, and, I, and when, when I looked at this, I thought some people, the only interaction with anything African would have been, you know, the shoebox appeal those uh, adverts on the television where kids have got snort and they are crying and they flies everywhere in Africa. And, and, and it builds that narrative and that brand of what Africa is. And, and, and so when they see you in settings where you're required to be slightly maybe more eloquent or you, you need a bit of qualification or the executives only in the room, naturally in their heads, they, they don't expect such things to come from Africa. So their subconscious mind then automatically classifies you as the default position that they expect someone like you to 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 hold. Uh, but again, all non-intended. Funny that, he, that you you explain it that way because I've had the experience even in America that I've had a different experience because I'm Asian. It's I'm okay. There, she's the Asian. She's the smart Asian, or you know. She, she's that token. They just, they kind of fall in. Once they realize that I'm Asian, you just kind of fall into this group. You're okay. And it's funny to hear you, like, you're automatically seen as the wait staff for some people. And I'm just kind of seen there as, oh, she's fine. She's Asian. She's allowed to be here. She's, she's okay. One thing that struck both of, from what both of you were saying was that, that issue of, like, what, what someone's intent is versus the impact that it has. Even though like the intent for both of these situations that you described may not have been, may not have came from a place of malice or, um, you know, actively trying to dehumanize you. That, that is very clearly the kind of impact that statements like that can have. So that's, uh, 
yeah, thank you for sharing both of those with us. Hugh, Hugh what's a, what, what are some of the things that you've kind of seen growing up here yourself or, or even raising Taraku and Josh? Well, just it's funny. Uh, I'm reading Emma Tabiri's uh, book, Don't Touch My Hair, uh, because I wish I got paid for every time the kids get rolled on the head. Uh, because, you know, they're like I'm a biased dad. I think they're attractive kids, but particularly with the name. Uh, I don't like to think they take out after after me, Jeff. Just <laughs> uh, we, when we go out as a family, and I tend to take the kids shopping and give Maria a break. Uh, certainly, particularly women of a particular age, and kind of, I'm going to say north of 55, would almost instinctively go to rub their heads. And Taraku is now 10 and beginning to get irritated about it. Yeah. And I've had to learn how to shepherd them away because you can almost see it. And I actually think it comes from that uh, place of innocent naivety or exoticness. And kind of we, they're noisy kids and we're kind of a, we attract attention. I, I never wanted that to happen, but because of the makeup, we tend to attract attention. So certainly I'm trying to work out how do I manage that for them and give them the opportunity to say, look, that's not acceptable. And Tarku will say, no, please don't do that, which is kind of nice to see. And then you can see people reacting and thinking, really, I shouldn't have done it. And it's how do you actually take advantage of that opportunity to say, that's something that you should learn from and not do it again. And I'm not skilled or equipped or I haven't thought it through as to what the appropriate teaching should be in that particular moment. So I'd be very interested in seeing if people have a views on that. I certainly, to go back to your other question around how I've seen Irish society evolve, in my experience, it's been actually quite a benign and slow and gradual movement. And certainly I'm, I'm very struck by the fact that both of you talked about a change around 2005, 2006. That's when I would recall Ireland become, becoming much more ethnically diverse. And I think probably you can excuse some of the actions with that naive uh, exposure to something that's new. I'm worried or I'm concerned about how do I actually help the kids navigate something when it settles down. And this is not new. Like we, we chose uh, uh, an Educate Together school for, for Taraku originally. And like there were 65 different nationalities in a or uh, class school, which was great. Like we specifically chose that because it was going to be ethnically diverse. And in that environment, he was very safe and he, he didn't stand out. Mm. As he grows older and as he's more independent, he's going to run into these type of events and I need to work out, number one, how do I equip him for it? But number two, what is it? Because I think to some extent, I would grant people naivety at a certain age. I think younger than that, there's kind of almost a blind spot where people are beginning not really to see color because it's much more integral to what their experience is. But I don't know how to teach him. How do you take advantage of somebody's naivety and maybe change their mind? Like I remember, uh, certainly again, shopping seems to be where it happens to us. People would say, particularly to me or to, to Maria, they're lucky kids. Because the assumption is they're both from Africa and their assumption is that they were both in poverty and, you know, it's the live aid type stuff that people automatically assume when you talk about Ethiopia, which is a significantly different and diverse and complex and beautiful country, but that's how they come through. And how do you kind of say, well, actually, no, there's a whole lot of people who are lucky in this situation. We're absolutely gifted in terms of parents. And how do you actually take that opportunity and change that? Uh, conversation. So if you've got any sort of view in terms of how you gently maneuver people into, have you just thought about what you've done and make it a, a learning experience rather than a critique? Because I think people get very sensitive to a perceived critique. Because I think there is a lot of naive programming. The default setting is to be awkward or to be ignorant about stuff. I was just thinking about that, like where for, for, for kids it's slightly different. Like I grew up in Africa, so I, I probably have a slightly thicker skin than my, my, my kids here who, who, who are growing up here because we, we really went through more hardships in other parts of life. That mm -hmm. basically pre prepared me to tolerate. Uh, my tolerance levels are much higher than, than my children who I'm raising here. 
So, so I found uh, with them, uh, I think you, you need to pick your, your, your teaching moments for like that lady in the, in the shop. What I probably do, if that she does that, I'll probably tell her that, you know what, you know, it's, it's funny, like this happens all the time. Now, as a joke, I, I'm now even dreading coming in to do shopping because my, my kids are overwhelmed by people touching their hair. You, you know what, what's funny is the kids are actually, they feel that it, 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 it's, they're standing out as different. It's not very comfortable for them, you know? Mm -hmm. I know. I know people don't mean it like that, you know, but it's, it's really becoming a problem. You leave that person with that thought and they go away and knowing, yeah. Yeah, and, and just keep using the same the same trick. You might hit four or five people and they start talking about it. But it's all said in love and, 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 and jokingly. Uh, because for the hair, like my daughter, uh, she, is, she is five now and, and she is slightly kinky hair and, and it's a bit long and, and, and people did that before. Uh, and it got it got so so annoying that eventually we, we actually had to address it. We actually had to uh, speak to the individuals and actually say, look, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to be rude, but yeah. imagine if if you had a five year old kid, daughter, and I just woke up and in a shop and start touching their hair, <laughs> like the, the guards will be called, like I'll be locked up, you know, on a on a list somewhere. Uh, yeah. So 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 it's not appropriate because you're curious and you're not aware, you you, you have not thought about it. It's, it's just inappropriate. So you need to look at it like that. And it was very, actually stop and go, okay, this is uncomfortable. Mm. Now I see where you're coming from. And I tell, I tell you, they'll never ever touch any kids uh, again. Uh, and and on, the, on, the, on the side of the kids, I've had to explain to them. You see, the not talking about it, especially in your house, is the worst thing you can do. Mm. Because, because where else can, can you talk about it? So I've told them, guys, look, don't be naive. You are black. And it's okay to be black. Yeah. Uh, you're going to meet people who are not used to uh, dealing with people who are different. Yeah. So, so you, have a, you, you need to learn that most of these people are either doing it naively and, and some are, are just not good people. And you're actually in a better position by being able to tolerate and handle them and avoid them rather than trying to educate them if they don't want to be educated. And I found with my son that is actually works. And uh, my, my, my other two daughters, yeah, they're, they're, they're getting there. They actually uh, probably maybe a bit just below the, the teenage years. They, they, they're not seeing it as much. They're like, oh, everything is okay, Dad. Thanks for telling us that, that we're different. But they don't even see the, any difference. They say, you're from Zimbabwe. We are, we are from, yeah, we are Irish. I'm like, okay, <laughs> stay, stay there. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. So it, it, I have to say the hair thing is just stunningly... A big, a big, like lots of people kind of, kind of do it. And it, there's a certain sense of humor that their hair is attractive and nobody ever feels that my hair is ever attractive. Go <laughs> figure. <laughs> <laughs> when he was the head of HR, we had a couple of run-ins because I couldn't keep my hands off his head. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier, you know, talking about people coming and grab your kids here in public and, you say, how do you gently kind of ease them into understanding that it's not appropriate? And to be honest, I think Nelson Mandela said it best. He said, we have to consciously combat discrimination and not discreetly tolerate it. And I think for so, for so long, TT, you agree, we've kind of laughed it off and discreetly tolerated it. I think it comes a point where people just have to, you have to, look, you have to get, comf uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So essentially... One, as TT said, if we went up, if especially him as a black man went up and grabbed some white kids here in, in the shop, he'd be tackled to the ground. In the States, he'd yeah. probably come to further, more serious repercussions. I think at some stage, the ignorance wall, like you said, even the naivety, the naivety has to be kind of broke through with something that kind of really shocks you. Mm. So it's kind of like saying, uh, it's my kid, he's a child. If you want to pet something, I can take it out of my handbag or my bag, you can pet that. But, you know, or if I had my dog, you could pet him. But sometimes yeah. I think people need to just be told no. There's no yeah. sugar coating it. Yeah, like, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's very fair and reasonable. What I've been actually trying to do is make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm equipping the kids to, to manage that for themselves. And also I've kind of taken a benign uh, view on it because it, it, 
and again, this has just been my experience, it is always females and it is always of a particular age. And I, I actually would credit them with just not getting it. I'm trying to work out how do I actually help them get it. But I take the point. It's, it's very valid. I, I reconnected with that story about um, people unwanted touching of hair because at least someone, and that's the story what I, what I, the last bit which I got was that someone at least asked if it was okay. Like when I remember when my son Liam was a baby, people would reach into his buggy and start, go, oh, he's got great hair. I'm like, hey, what? Like you can't just touch random people's children. Um, which is just really weird and you know the same thing would obviously um, happen you know not just with babies it would happen like you're at the shop and someone's like oh you love your hair what are you doing personal space so it's for me the racism comes into it because what's under because in Ireland what we don't have is you know like KKK driving around with shotguns or anything it's not that it's it's covert and um, I feel like I've explained this before you know I feel like what we have in Ireland is tolerance and we confuse that a lot of the time with anti-racism and um, which are two different things and when you go through anti-racism and you understand white supremacy and you understand those things that are ingrained in all of us from birth that we have to unlearn that's where you start thinking why does someone think it's okay to touch my hair without asking for permission or touch my child's hair without asking for permission and it's like they feel entitled to be able to do that and you have to challenge that because you wouldn't those people wouldn't do the same thing to a white irish person obviously they would expect the person to go get away from my child and um, so it's challenging those sorts of things for me um that, that that's where that's where i see um that's, that's that's how I see racism in Ireland in terms of you know the covert racism that 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 happens and it's quite difficult in those situations to speak up and to try and explain why that's inappropriate or um why you might feel uncomfortable with that or why this person like asking this person to take a try and take a step back and think about why they felt that was an okay action to take but that's just jumping on the point that was made there. In terms of me, um, Jesus, I remember, so when I first moved here, um, so I was born in England, and when I first moved here, I moved to Nace, I remember in school people being like, your lips are so big, and, you know, different things about my skin, and blah, 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 and it meant that I did, you know, grow to hate my own skin colour, I grew to hate my own, um, you know, dislike my own race, and didn't really want to know anything about it, wanted to try and distance myself as much from it, so I could try and fit in, because I had so much stuff going at home, going on at home, that school was the only place that I felt wasn't turbulent, so I wanted to try and fit in as much there, and in the last few years, um, I'd taken this step back, and I didn't realise I was doing that, obviously, at the time, I just, these were things I was just subconsciously doing, in the last few years, I'd taken a step back, and like it's not just white people that have to unlearn everything they knew about race black people do as well I find I you know I've been going on a journey in the last few years and I still don't know everything I'm still learning every day like on this call I'm sure I'll learn from everyone on this call as well you know different things that I didn't know about race every black person's experience of racism is not the same and um, but what's heartbreaking is you know that was you know, um, when was I 11? <laughs> 15 years ago. And um, my son, um, I recently had to, a couple years ago, I had to move his school um, because he was facing racist bullying um, and people were saying the N word. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrific. And the school, like my issue wasn't, like these were eight, nine year olds at the time, you know, so they obviously didn't know what they were saying. They were picking up from the kitchen table and, and all of that stuff. But the school was ridiculous. You know, the school was like, the N word is offensive to you. And it was like, hang on, sorry, what? And, you know, the fact that I was asking for people who displayed this behavior repeatedly, you know, after you had the chats and explained and blah, 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 to face some sort of punishment, you know, for this really hurtful word, it was like, we can't understand, we can't relate to that, we can't empathize with, you know, with, with that. And that was really stressful. And to the extent that my son stopped telling the teachers whenever racist things happened, and it was his white friends who would go up and tell the teachers and be like, oh, this kid just did X, Y, Z. Because even those kids at eight or nine knew that was wrong and knew this behavior wasn't okay. And um, I had to move, move his school in the end just because I didn't feel 
Like I was always, I was literally for that year attached to my phone. I was getting phone calls, you know, at least once a week of this is happening to your son, blah, blah, blah. And it was horrible. It's heartbreaking. You just want to be there with your kid and give him a big hug. So I had to move to school. I just couldn't, I couldn't trust that they could keep my child safe while he was there. It was also affecting his own self-confidence in terms of his hair. So he's always had this like, Salim is mixed race, first of all. So that's an interesting one to explain because he spends one weekend here and spends the next weekend with his dad. So when all of this started, he was like, what is going on? You know, he's just never... He, I, it was heartbreaking that I had to explain racism to my eight, nine-year-old who had just never seen a difference before. You know, he's like, I go to both houses, I just presume, you know, um, everyone everyone looks different. That's normal. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he did, it didn't sink in with him that, you know, he looked, because he, he, it just didn't sink in with him that we were different, I think, you know, that we were in some way that, that someone would look would pick on you for you know and um, because he has that, that huge family with his dad and um, so yeah it's heartbreaking that I that, that I had to go through that um, and that Liam had to go through that and I think it was just the fact that you know I would have hoped that 15 years later or you know whatever 13 at that stage and um, things would have changed things would have moved on and my son wouldn't be having the same experiences that I had when I was in um, primary school so that's that's heartbreaking but yeah it's just an example Thanks for sharing that, Deborah. That's, uh, yeah. yeah, that is heartbreaking. Um, there were a few things that you said in there, though, that also kind of resonated a little bit with the conversation I was having with Wahid the other day about growing up mixed race in Ireland as well. Wahid, would you mind maybe sharing a little bit of some of what you were talking about the other day as well? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so like I was born in the, the mid 80s in uh, James's hospital. Uh, my mother is from Ballyferma. Um, my father is Libyan. Um, so yeah, like growing up in Dublin in the 80s as a mixed race kid um, was a little bit strange. Like I think I could count on one hand the amount of black people that I actually like uh, came into contact with for a good period. Um, and then I, I, moved to, I moved to Birmingham in the UK at the age of 10. And the UK likes to put uh, anybody that isn't middle, middle class British together. So Irish people and black people uh, are all put into housing estates together. Um, and yeah, it was kind of eye-opening as to the culture that I was missing out on. Um, my father hasn't been around since I was like four years old as well. So. Um, yeah, and then I, I moved back here and uh, when I was 20, um, having like built up strong relationships and friendships with uh, mixed race black kids uh, in the area I lived in and like gotten to know that side of myself. Um, and it was interesting to come back here when I was 20 and uh, with, a, with a new perspective in terms of the micro. Uh, I, I just think they were, I thought they were annoying in, in, in isolation, but it's the, uh, the cumulative effect of where are you really from? Um, yeah, just the not being believed that you could actually be Irish. Um, so yeah, um, the, the where are you from, where are you really from is, Something I got pissed off with so much that I, I turn around to people now and I just say, what you really want to know is why am I brown, right? Um, and that usually <laughs> shuts them up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I have a kind of a, a strange relationship with being Irish because I love, I love being Irish. I love Ireland. Um, but I also... From a, a small minority, don't feel like, even though I'm born here, raised here, uh, family here, from here, uh, still don't feel like I'm considered 100% Irish or as Irish as somebody who, in the exact same predicament as me with white skin, would be considered Irish. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, as we, were, as we were talking the other day, we were, we were mentioning our 
respective experiences as uh, technically I'm Irish as well. Now I've gone through the whole passport and citizenship mm-hmm. process and everything, but just how different that experience could be just um, passing for, for Irish. Um, yeah. you, you had mentioned as well, like you had even had a little bit of a identity crisis is a bit of this. You haven't always been Wahida Malawi. Yeah. Um, my name growing up in Dublin was Wade Coughlin, even though on my birth certificate it's Wahid Anwar Mifta El Um But yeah, I, I assumed that it was to make things easier for me in, like, in terms of having to explain uh, how to spell it and stuff, which I don't get. It's fairly easy. Uh, it's phonetic, Wahid. Um, but yeah, I think after a while I realized there's actually easier for everybody else to not have to deal with my uh, North African uh, Arabic name. Um, and I think that's why I lived with that for the period I did. Yeah, it was only when I went to the UK and uh, realized that it was fine to have like non-traditional Irish names. Uh, yeah. I got pretty adamant about using it. Um, I'm very proud of using it as well. So. Thanks for sharing that, man. It's, uh, it's just mind boggling to see the things that uh, all of you or hear the things that all of you have talked about today and how they can impact your identity in such, in so many fundamental ways, both, you know, the name you call yourself, how you look at your own skin. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And just like thinking about Deborah's song, I wonder if it's the same. Um, but because I already stood out because of the color of my skin growing up, I was also, I was always very aware of not standing out. I would always wear my uniform because it's like, I'm already black. I don't need to be uh, standing out for anything else. Um, and then also like, if somebody doesn't like you when you've experienced racism, you don't know if it's just you or if it's they don't like you because of like what you are or what you look like, which gets confusing and it, it, it adds a level of noise to relationships that you have as you go on as well. That's kind of uh, burdensome. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting thing that I think has come up as in listening to all of you talk about this. There's with, with maybe this, well, I think Selena even kind of fits into this category, um, but you know, there's this element of, of ignorance associated with the behaviors, the, the way people in, uh, interact with you sometimes, and that the cultural context of this is so much different here in Ireland than it would be you know, for like Mindy and I and Selena, where we grew up in the United States, where you know, there's, a, there's a legacy of, of slavery, of Jim Crow, of like, you know, active segregation that goes back barely 50 years in our history, um, uh, a lack of reconciliation around any of this. Um, and it's, you know, it's something in many ways that it, it's kind of baked into American culture and society. I'm, I'm curious, not having that legacy here, does it, does it make it less, does it make it come from less of a place of evil? Does it make it come from less of a place of like hatred and vitriol and, and more of this place of just like not knowing and not being as exposed to this kind of thing? Or I'm, I'm curious what you all sort of think about that or if that even makes a difference at all. My personal view is that it comes from ignorance here and it comes from a lack of communication and a lack of exposure. I think from an American standpoint, as a person from an ethnic diverse background and being the first born American generation in my family is in the US, it's funny, how do I explain this? When I came to Ireland was the first time I realized that my skin color was different. But when I actually start to think back and I look at my experiences and my family's experiences in America, there was more rife racism there. I just became more educated while I was living here. And what am I trying to get at here? So essentially, I think in the US, people know about it and it's ingrained in us and it's thrown in our face, diversity and culture and cultural relativity and differences and race and all of those things. 
but the biggest flaw to American society and America's approach to racism and discrimination is that Americans do not like to talk about politics. Americans don't like to talk about race. And I think because of that, it's thrown in our face and everybody accepts it. And you smile in my face and you probably smile in my face, but at the same time, you're probably making a racial comment about me in the back of your head. And to be realistic, I'd rather you just say it straight to my face and we can combat it. So I think the problem in the States is this, there's been a malaise, there's this, there's been a festering of discrimination because nobody wants to talk about it because it makes people uncomfortable. In Ireland, mm. I think people do want to talk about it. That's why they're reaching out and they're touching our hair or, you know, they're asking the questions and it's pure naivety, ignorance. And yes, there probably is racism. There is a different form of racism. And correct me if I'm wrong, Irish people, that is here in Ireland and it's more the Catholic Protestant thing. But I think they do want to know. They just haven't been exposed to it. Whereas I think in the U.S. it's a bit more nefarious. There's a bit more, there's a maliciousness to it. And it comes from the fact that we know it's there. We don't want to talk about it. We rather make the racial slurs and commentary in our house. And mm -hmm. out in the open, we're going to say, oh, we're diverse and we're, we're inclusive. But realistically, you're not really. You, in deep down inside, there's a portion of people in parts of America that aren't. And that's been compacted by executive decisions, judiciary decisions, legislative decisions, especially with the impact of affirmative action that resonated out of the 70s and 80s in America. I think, I think that's a point as well. It's like the impact of it in the States is you can't get an education, you can't get a house, you might be locked up uh, for a large part of your life, you can't get a job, and you might possibly be murdered on the street because of the color of your skin. Whereas in Ireland, it's not systematic. The impact of it is made like a lot less. Uh, it's more of a personal impact I, I've found. It's less of a systematic impact that is present in Ireland. I would disagree. I would say that it is systemic in, in Ireland. And actually, you know, there's actually a whole academic um, papers uh, this woman, Dr. Eben Joseph, um, she lectures on black studies in UCD and um, she's actually written a couple of pa academic papers on systemic racism in Ireland and how it impacts people in terms of their employment prospects in particular. And that's been something actually, not just her, but the Equality of the Commission and, um, you know, the Irish um, her Higher Quality Commission, I don't know, the IHREC, there's so many letters, they don't know what they stand for, but, you know, they've done reports as well on it in terms of, so before COVID hit, um, the unemployment rate in Ireland was 5.5%. For black men, it was over 40%. Wow. So that's how, that's how, you know, and, but like, we don't, we don't talk about these things. So I think that, like, th there is a mix of, yes, there is a level of ignorance because we don't talk about this. We're not educated about it in our schools the same way that people are in America. Like, when I went to the D&I talks now, like, I literally print out kindergarten, like, uh, material from America and I'm like that's where we're at here is like this is the best I can if I do anything more advanced than this people will stare at me like I've done it I literally have to start from from that little but I actually in Ireland I see it as and I think we do still have that really fake thing of people who will have these really ignorant opinions um, and who will smile at your face and would rather have that conversation at home you know like how, you know, black people in, or travellers or blah, blah, blah. Or someone might be like, oh, no, I'm not racist. And then be like, oh, travellers are all here. Like, you know, they're they're all going to steal from you if you get them to, to do your garden or something. I'm like, hang on. Like, you know, people don't connect those two things together. So there's a lot of ignorance there that impacts people. But I put people in three categories. And um, in general, when I look at racism, it's probably not great. But anyways, um, it's just kind of my own. You, you develop your own coping tools to just try and make sense of you know, um, like, uh, you know, just trying to make sense of the different people you meet and, you know, what, what might it take to interact with them, to be completely honest with you. So I put people in group A, which is, you know, I, you just say the word racism, they, they're already, they, they're educated a bit, you know, they probably have a black friend, a black child, you know, a, you know, a black best friend, someone that they've grown up with, that they have seen this behavior, they've seen this different behavior 
they know that it exists in our culture um, and they want to do something to try and you know they want to have the conversation they want to try and learn to see how they can make it better then we have the group um c which is the kkk people that we do have those people here you know we do have now they're not driving around the streets with guns but we do have the orange order guys and all that other stuff they're burning black lives matter stuff in their big huge bonfire you know just a couple weeks ago so we do have those groups here and it's not just in northern ireland apparently they do a parade up sheriff street party like once a year as well so it's not just you know and um, this far away thing and they're scary people absolutely you know they're in a different box you know they're criminals but then we have this middle group and I feel um, uh, that's a bit closer to you know they could go either way they're they're open to being educated you know um, and it's about the right person educating them because if the wrong person educates them they could go into group A or group C in my opinion they can either grow to really hate and um, diversity and the beautiful things that brings to their country feel like it's taking something away from them somehow all of that nonsense you know have these un these beliefs about travelers not paying tax and this that and the other just things that aren't based on facts you know that are just based on i've been grown up this is what i've heard this is what everyone around here thinks and nobody can actually back it up with any facts and um, but then i feel like you know if the right person is educating they can go into group a so that's where i think that our education system has a big role to play here, you know, um, black history should be on our history syllabus, you know, <laughs> like there have, as, as much as there's been very few black people, there have been black people here, like there's literally, I just saw something on Twitter about the first black um, Irish singer, um, and she's from like the 18th century, so it's a painting, not even a picture of her, you know, um, and then you when you look at the mother and baby homes you know and how mixed race children were treated in mother and baby homes which is horrific and um, same thing they're made to feel like there was something wrong with them because of the color of their skin like it, it really frustrates me when people say you know this is a new issue for Ireland because it's not it's something that's been there the whole time that we've just not really similarly to America not really wanted to talk about you know not really wanted to address and we've We've also held all of these really weird beliefs. Like, I am so surprised. I'm like, when all of this stuff came out about how there were a few slave traders that lived in Ireland, and so we did have slaves, I was like, for the last like decade, all anyone's been screaming whenever we try and have this debate is black people, is Irish, Irish people can't be racist because we didn't have slavery and you know we were colonized too and all of this stuff. And it's like, actually, <laughs> so again, that's just going back to the whole we have these beliefs and these things we talk to people about and you know that aren't necessarily just backed up with facts. And so it's encouraging we need to educate people with what the actual facts are. And I think, yeah. And you haven't even mentioned yeah. direct provision in uh, all the things that you talked about as well. So yeah, exactly. yeah, that, that's so, look, you, you, you nailed it on the head. There almost a lot of stuff to to say, uh, guys. Uh, I totally agree. I, I think I think the the if you think about it, the system was built for the Irish by the Irish people uh, for themselves, uh, and uh, it, it's only been as you mentioned earlier. I'd say in a few a few decades uh, where there's been a significant number of, of people, particularly black people, uh, coming into into Ireland. Uh, the UK and other parts of the world have probably had a, a long run at it, uh, so some close to centuries. Uh, meanwhile, in Ireland, the, the black people were, were been here, but in again in very small dots, small portions. You could probably count uh, if you go back thirty years from, from thirty years back. So so I'll say those systems. Although they might they might be slightly different to the ones in the U.S., where, which were potentially designed to discriminate, most of the systems mm -hmm. were designed for those people before we came in. So, so what's happening? What's happening now is that there hasn't been a a conscious reassessment on how can we change those to actually accommodate the new wave of people who have actually come in uh, and. Uh, elements of that, the, the system not being changed, are then creating some some noise in some of the Irish people who are looking at their system, and their system is trying to um, to, to incorporate and so, for example, uh, the direct provision system. They're looking at it, thinking, "Oh, these guys are parasitic. Why are we letting them in? We'll just send them back, and they're using some of our resources. And why are they here? Why, why we don't even want them in our city? They, but if the system had adjusted." 
to actually incorporate them in a way that demonstrates their value and also in a way that quickly incorporates them in, into the Irish society, mm-hmm. you'd find that we wouldn't have a lot of people hanging around the, the centers for 5, 10, 15 years without contributing anything and and uh, and then creating that negative uh, approach. I've worked with guys in accounting who have actually, their parents came into the egg provision and then those kids have actually become very successful uh, individuals in the Irish society and their parents, when they got the opportunity after many years of staying, they have also contributed to the society so so i'd say the key element there is yeah we have our system, systematic and process problems uh, they might not be identical to the us or the uk but they there needs to be a gear shift to acknowledge that our, our schools to the broadest point they, they don't cover uh, content from the middle east they don't cover content from mm-hmm. from africa they, they they still continue to be exactly the same as they were 40 50 years ago uh, and then that means that the kids will never see anyone who looks like them who did anything of significance in history. So then they, 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 they just have no frame of reference and, and it makes it very difficult for the kids to cope. You know, going on to what you just said there, TT and Jeff, you were saying, bringing up the aspect of direct provision. My biggest gripe here, because like I've done some research in asylum law, is that one, the general Irish population does not understand the basics of what claiming asylum is, that there has to be strict fundamental, there has to be strict key factors for them to prove base, a, a key one being the persecution of fear, the fear of persecution, and the fact that the general population in Ireland don't understand the difference between a refugee, an asylum seeker, and a migrant worker. And that's a big issue. And the Irish government has not gone out of its way to raise awareness on that, which again, has uh, and, and to let Irish people understand why asylum seekers aren't allowed to contribute. And it's because of the construct of the Irish government that doesn't allow asylum seekers to contribute and then impacts them first, uh, causes a further impact from a socioeconomic standpoint and from an alienation standpoint within general Irish population. That, that, that's, I've got a real big gripe about that because it seems like the Irish government has just stayed quiet on it. And have just let this 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 other wave of racism just fester. It's interesting as well, juxtapositioned against. I remember when we first moved here, uh, the number of television adverts that we would see for things like Trocora and all of these uh, charities geared towards you know helping children in Africa, and then they get here to the soil of the country where you could really help them in a significant way, and and you've got that resistance. Um, you know, I'm, one, one thing I'm cognizant of here, especially given the makeup that we've got on the panel today, is like we got a handful of immigrants here in the in the pool. Um, we're all, as far as I know, I think we're all Irish citizens. Um, if not, we're all definitely contributing members to society. Um, good jobs, paying your taxes. I'm assuming. So we're going to talk of about course. yes. <laughs> we're going to talk about people not paying taxes. We could talk about Apple, but we'll save that for another talk. But I'm I'm curious as like I, I fear like there's is there a danger in like the perception of this discussion being that you know here's people coming in from outside our country trying to tell us we're racist trying to tell us um, how to run our country like what would you say to that? I think that like with the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that that's where the conversation was. Like personally. I'm not willing to engage in those conversations anymore because there are just so many people who are saying, I want to listen to you. I want to listen to your experience in my country, in my community, and let's do something to try and fix it. And it might be ignorant, but you know, at the same time, my white friends, I need them to, <laughs> you know, to, to tackle those harder questions. You know, when someone is challenging on those types of things, you know, that's where the authorship really comes in, you know, explaining that to someone who's like you, who's from the same community and saying, no, no, it's not like that. This is actually the way that it is. And sometimes people are just able to hear things better if it's coming from a white Irish person, you know. So I don't know about anybody else, but I think after this Black Lives Matter movement, I'm just tired. I'm not debating anymore. You know, it's like if you're not willing to listen, learn and take action, then there's no, there's no reason for us to be having a why would I engage in the emotional labor of this conversation if nothing will come out of it, you know? 
it's interesting that notion of social proof you talked about there kind of because like as we were, as i was talking to tt the other day he i remember him relating the story of like talking to one of his colleagues that oh, no this doesn't exist in the country and then once you started telling your story tt it was kind of like oh shit well if tt says it like it must be true i know this guy i respect him like that's exactly and they, and they were shocked that it would happen to me they, yeah they were like look we, we thought maybe there's a, there's a line in society that once you cross that you are kind of immune you don't you don't need to have those kind of people so Geez, we 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 are shocked this is happening to you. <laughs> uh, to, to, to your point, I just add uh, to what Demar is saying. Uh, uh, I totally agree. This is the, this is the Irish people's country. This is their soil. This is this is home for them, and we need to preserve that as their home. Uh, but we have to acknowledge, like like I've met, I met a lot of Irish people before I I, I even came to Ireland. Before I even knew where where, where Ireland was on the, on the map. Uh, because uh, there were many of them in Zimbabwe, uh, with very successful farmers across our industry and commerce, and, and, and they, they were embraced and, by our society, uh, and they contributed. And most of them are Zimbabweans. They, they don't, they're not even Irish now. Uh, and and I've, I've gone to a few African countries where, where that, that's the same. Uh, and and I, I believe our presence here is not to try and basically dissolve or dilute or destroy their Irishness. We basically mm -hmm. are, are here to also enjoy the, the riches of the Irish culture. Whilst we, we also share elements that are good about our own culture, and we're just asking for their openness, for us to embrace uh, each other and actually just uh, develop a much richer culture. Hmm. Love that. That's great, TT. Thanks. I think that, like, uh, the dilution of culture and stuff is, especially as a mixed race Irish person. Um, I've been a mixed race and Irish. I am a physical embodiment uh, of the dilution of Irish culture to some people. Um, mm. they, I've actually even heard the term like white genocide happening uh, due to multiculturalism. It's usually from lads with Ireland flags and their Twitter handles. Um, but yeah, is and I think it points to the fact that Irishness is inextricably linked to being white, um, and that's like something that we we need to change. Uh, you can be non-white and be Irish, um, and yeah, I I hope things are getting better, but maybe uh, more slowly than I'd like to see. Hmm. It's interesting too because like. We live in a world now, like, you know, the, the one of the fundamental underpinnings of our conversation today is we're talking about something that people can't change about themselves. None of you can change the color of your skin or where you were born or anything like that. But like we live in a world today where being born in America or being born in Zimbabwe or being born in the UK doesn't mean that that's where you have to live or that's where your life uh, unfolds. Um, and it's uh, it maybe is a new concept for some people. Um, so obviously, you know, part of what we wanted to talk about today, and I'm um, just conscious of the time here, and, and want to try to move us towards some of the action stuff that, that I talked about with each of you as well. Um, first of all, thank you very much, each of you, for kind of opening up and sharing some of your own stories. And there was something that, that TT said when he was talking about this story of being stuck in the, the business class queue and the, the person working for the airline didn't think that he was supposed to be there, and he approached us from this place of love. Um, really resonated with me because I, I went out on a walk of probably a month and a half ago. It was after George Floyd. Everything was just, the world felt chaotic. It felt like our country back in the United States was falling apart. And I walked down the canal and I, I saw, I walked past a guy who was sitting on a park, on a bench right next to a bin and he chucked a plastic bottle into the canal. I kind of lost it. And I was just like, what are you, what are you doing, man? Like, what the F is going on here? And we, we almost got into a little bit of a shoving match. And I, I'm, I'm a nonviolent kind of person. I realized, like, I need to just get the hell out of here and walk away. And as I walked away, I thought about this. And I thought the one thing that I didn't do, that I wasn't happy with myself about it in that moment, was that I, I didn't approach it from a place of love. I approached it from a place of conflict. And there was never, that conversation was never going to lead anywhere positive. Engaging with him in uh, that negative kind of way of, like, accusation, uh, vilification, whatnot. So 
what advice would you all open would you offer to anyone who's interested in having some of these hard conversations maybe with maybe with their friends maybe with their family maybe in the workplace that approaches this from a place of love and opens that conversation up as opposed to to shutting it down if you see underpinning all this it, it, it's a suspicion or misunderstanding of difference so so the things we don't understand uh, typically we are afraid of them or we misjudge them. Uh, before I came to Ireland, I, I, I had a few bad experiences with Indian people in Zimbabwe who actually owned a few businesses there. They were very racist and, uh, and they would verbally say it to you. Uh, and when I came to Ireland, I, I still carried that. And, and one of my friends took me to a church that was uh, two thirds Indian people, uh, uh, people from uh, mostly south, south of India, Tamil Nadu. Uh, and within, I'll say within a, about a month, I was very uh, suspicious of them, didn't like them, and thought, oh, they're all the same. And it turned out they're some of the most lovely people uh, I ever met in my life. And, and, and now I love Indian food. Like I can cook some of it now. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and it opened my heart. Uh, and, 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 and I learned and understood. Some of my good friends now are from, from, from India. Uh, and, 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 and so what I could say to our Irish colleagues is that, look, you have to open your heart, number one, to question uh, some of your biases, identify and question some of your biases. Because uh, if you think you're not racist, because you've not encountered maybe a black person or an Indian person or someone in a situation where maybe you got angry and what you really think came out, that doesn't mean you don't have those racist intents. So I, I really want you to challenge you at home when you're not in the situation to really think about it. What do I think about people who are different? What's, what, what do I really feel? And, and when you do that, you, 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 you then start understanding what you can deal with. Then you can reach out with an open heart and honesty to the people who are different. Invite them to your house. If, don't just meet people in the park. You really want to know people Invite them for, for, for lunch. So if you know a lot of uh, Asians or Africans and you've known them for 10, 15 years and they never come to your house for lunch or anything or barbecue and you claim you want to know more and you want to understand, you probably need to, that's your starting point that would be my mind. Thanks, Titi. Brilliant. Anyone else? Um, I'd agree. That was actually the first point I was going to make. So thank you. <laughs> you did it so much better than I would <laughs> Um, but the second one, again, just coming at it from, you know, the systemic perspective of when the gender pay gap stuff happened and when we kind of realised there's an issue there systemically with women progressing into higher roles and, um, and earning the same salaries and everything else, what every organisation has committed to doing and is doing, well has to do, is that systemic review of their policies and procedures to ensure that there's nothing there preventing women from being able to progress. So, for example, you know, childcare and different things like that. So, working flexibly is now, you know, a norm in the workplace as a result to make sure that, you know, I, I can meet my target. I just need to meet it at maybe not the same time hours, you know, during the same hours as, as my male counterpart. The same thing applies here. Um, I think the EU actually um, passed a resolution last year on Afro Afrophobia in the EU, and every member state now has to take some sort of action to, first of all, acknowledge that Afrophobia exists um, and try to address it. And so it's not, again, not African centric, but this should be done across the board for the nine protected classes that are there. It's like, where do you start? And like, there's literally like, you know, a law there that like gives you your starting point and going, you know, we say we're diverse and we're inclusive. Is it actually, first of all, is it accessible for people in those classes to get into our organization? How easy is it for them in comparison to other people to progress and, you know, to be treated equally in our organizations? Okay, let's look at our leadership team and our board. Is that, is, is the diversity box we ticked only gender? Why did we do that? You know, again, challenging those top processes of, we thought this was okay, but it's actually not. So I'm really, I, I would say, really encouraging um, people to, to do that do that work where possible with their organizations or encourage their organizations to do it. or if they run an organization do it with the organization they run they're just, they're just reviewing and ensuring it's it, it is truly inclusive um yeah 
their environment. Hmm. That's great. Thanks, Deborah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, for me, it's, uh, I think, inaction is complicity as well, right? Like, um, even if you're not educated and, like, just, I think somebody else said it earlier, I think it was Denver, but, like, putting the pressure on your black friends to educate you is putting more pressure on them at a time when shit's already kind of hard. So, like, do your own research. And also, like, if you encounter something or you see something or hear something, like, not pulling people up on it, let's start spread and let that peer person think that it was okay to say uh calling them out let's them know and let's everybody else around them know that it's not okay to say and like if you don't know what's right and what's wrong in terms of uh things that should and shouldn't be said then uh, i think you have bigger problems to deal with um but yeah i think like the you, you can't be an ally and keep your mouth shut. You need to, when we're not around, we can't be everywhere. Black people can't be everywhere. And when we are, like, it gets exhausting to have to be the one that is, like, bringing it up and calling people out. Uh, yeah, be proactive. Um, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. As, I was, as we were talking to Deborah the other day, she mentioned as well that notion that... Uh, Sometimes, especially here in Ireland, where there there might not be a lot of uh, black people, you're you're often the the representative for your entire race, uh, which is like, how the hell does that work? You know, um, <clears throat> great, uh, Selena, Hugh, any anything from from either of you? Yeah, I think everybody's kind of hit it. TT, Deborah, you really hit it there. Um, my experience living in this country fifteen years is. I think Irish companies are completely deficit of a diversity and inclusion program um, of any sort. Like in the last couple of years, the companies I've worked for, bar the American tech companies, the Irish companies had nothing. You know, uh, probably me walking around the office with their diversity and inclusion program, which is a bit deplorable. Uh, mm. You know, at the same time, I think the big issue here in Ireland is that I think people who are white skin, let's say white skin. And in all honesty, that shouldn't stop people because I think if white skin people actually dug into their past, they realize that their white skin isn't as pure as they think it is. There's a bit more melange there. There's a bit more, more of a mixture. Um, but that's a completely different discussion for a different time. I think people need to ask the questions, even if it's uncomfortable. I think people need to kind of cop on you don't walk up and just touch anybody's hair, irrespective of whether or not they're a different color or not. You know, I think it's a bit of common sense that it's, that is in deficit. Um, that's, that's, that's a, as, as what he said, if you can't kind of figure out what's right or wrong to say out of your mouth, you got a bigger issue on hand. And you think you need to delve a little bit deeper into yourself and kind of apply that to your actions out in the open to other people. Um, I think key thing here is I think diversity and inclusion needs to be ramped up in Ireland. I think people need to ask the questions. People need to question. Asking questions and questioning is not wrong. The way you ask it or the way you go about trying to figure out that information, I think is where the problem is. Um, overall, I think I, I welcome, I look forward to more cultures, the Brazilian culture coming into Ireland. The Venezuelan culture is quite prominent and it's coming in now. Um, I hope with more people coming over, especially with the tech companies, we will see diversity and inclusion coming through on a more holistic, I guess, holistic approach than just through this procedural and policy driven aspect in a company, um, a, co a company environment. So I think just overall, I think it needs to, I think people need to ask the questions. Companies need to do their bit. Let's see where it goes from there. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Selena. You're welcome. Hugh, anything from you, buddy? Yeah, see, I'm kind of very struck uh, by what he said about being white and Irish. So there are kind of two things that are going through just about through my head, and one is the story. So, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago, I was going in shopping Saturday morning, and I parked the car at the back of Tower Street, 
uh, just behind the GNIB uh, building, which was open for uh, Saturday mornings. And I took Tarek away, and he was asleep in the morning. And I took him out and I put him in a, a buggy between the two cars. And I went to go and pay uh, the uh, ticket for the for parking. And this lady walked by and she saw this little black kid in a, asleep in a buggy. And she started looking around very strangely. like, And obviously I was male and patently white and very unlikely to be his father. And she made a comment around, this always happens. And it, it took me a while to work out what she was talking about, but I think what she was talking about was she made the assumption that this was somebody going to the GNIB. I mean, why would they leave their kid behind this kind of concept, all right? And I remember, I didn't, I kind of pointed to the fact that he was mine, but I actually felt very protective around it. And when Taraku and Josh is asleep, I can actually carry them on my shoulder and they can stay asleep. It looks like I'm carrying kind of a large lamb over my shoulder, but I remember picking him up and taking him away, like not using the buggy, and being quite upset by the fact that people made an assumption that I couldn't be his dad, and equally that he couldn't be Irish. So that kind of really resonated with me, and I'm trying to work out how do we kind of tackle some of the, the systematic uh, and the inbuilt assumptions that are there. I suppose I could take a lot of the points that people have made, but certainly from the hospital's perspective, uh, what I'm beginning to see is the demographics are making this change happen anyway. Uh, I've had a chance to, to review, like we've got 4,600 people, give or take. We've got 68 different nationalities. There isn't a, like a, an underlying concern I have about the fact that we're relying on overseas staff a lot. And I think there's a, an element of that that I'm kind of uncomfortable about. But we've got 15% of our staff who are Indian and Philippine nationals. So you can begin to see that that ethnic diversity is driving a level of conversation. What I've taken from this conversation is, you know, personally, how do I take opportunities to uh, educate and challenge? Uh, I'm not skilled on that, but TT, some of the stuff that you said was lovely. I heard some of the stuff that you said around being white and Irish. That that uh, that upsets. That's uh, something I'd have to be worried about for the kids. Yeah. Thanks for sharing here. You know, I think all of you have kind of touched on this notion of like, we have to educate ourselves. We have to understand the reality of the world that we live in and, and what's really going on. Um, one place that can really be a great place for white people to start understanding uh, this a little bit about their own whiteness and, and how they've gotten to where they're at is a podcast series on seen on radio called Seeing White. Um, there's also a new Instagram feed that uh, one of you pointed out to me the other day called Black and Irish, which uh, has a whole bunch of stories from people who fit the bill. They're black and they're Irish, and we all just better get used to it because they're part of what makes this country amazing. And um, and after that, once you've maybe educated yourself a little bit, like trying to put some of this stuff into action, um, a couple of recommendations that uh, that we might throw out there: uh, a book by a, a gentleman named Ibram Kindi called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And there's a woman named Ken Creighton in the U.S. as well, uh, who's running a series of webinars on how to be an anti-racist at home and work. Uh, we attended one of those for our anniversary. It was a hell of a way to spend our 22nd anniversary, but uh, it was great. Um, and uh, the thing that really stuck out to me, I guess, uh, sitting through that was there was a lot of stuff that wasn't new to me, but it dawned on me that it wasn't new to me because I, 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 took African-American studies as like my degree program in university. So it was something that I actively sought out to learn the history of my own country. It shouldn't be something that people have to do. So I think the more that, you know, we start to bake that kind of stuff into how we educate people, um, the better. So you are all beautiful people. Uh, we really want to thank you for, for being open to having this discussion with us today, for sharing some of your own stories, for opening up and, and talking about some things that might be painful to, to get out there, but we think this is the kind of stuff that people need to hear to understand like what's really going on. And uh, just can't thank you all enough for, for your willingness to join us today. Yes, I mean, the, the conversation and the discussions were great. And, um, you know, we're always here. If you wanna continue this conversation at a later date, we may be contacting you again to try to um, see how, you know, things may hopefully be progressing and other actions that we can take after we've listened and learned a lot more. So thank you for starting this for us. <laughs> thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark.
being so proactive and actually setting it up because I probably would have talked about this for years and never done it. <laughs> well, I told you, man, you were, your tweet was the inspiration to me that, uh, like, we should just have a conversation about this. And, uh, I apologize to each of you. It took a little bit of time given uh, some of the logistical problems that we had trying to bring some other folks in, but uh, we uh, couldn't, couldn't have been happier with the group we had today. You were all fantastic. So thank you so much. Yes.